Right, uh, folks, um, welcome uh, from me and a huge thank you to Emily and to Francis for inviting me here today. Um, focus is going to be on an ancestral diet approach for sports and performance, but by that I'm kind of really just referring to paleo diets, but for various reasons um, I get quite anxious about throwing the word paleo out there. Uh, because uh, perhaps we don't just quite understand exactly what it means, but we'll, uh, we'll run through that. Um, at any stage, feel free to um, get up, walk about, uh, go to the toilet, uh, ask questions, or uh, tweet or Facebook if you get bored. Um, but I'll, I'll be around for the rest of the day, so you want to pick up on anything, then we, are, uh, we can easily do so. So then, uh, what are we talking about when we're talking about the paleo diet? It's, um, well, it's the diet's believed to have been followed by our, um, our Paleolithic ancestors. Uh, Paleolithic era starting two and a half million years ago to roughly about 15, 10, 20 and 10,000 years ago. Uh, so it's obviously a huge period, it's a vast period uh, characterised by Stone Age, by Ice Age and so on. And, uh, and perhaps that's one of the reasons why we can't definitively say there's going to be one paleo diet because it would have been very, um, would have changed a heck of a lot based on seasons, based on location. So two and a half million years ago, we were all based out of East Africa before we started to spread and, uh, and colonize all other parts of the globe there. Following the Paleolithic era came the Neolithic era, um, uh, normally called Bronze Age, and uh, with that was characterized primarily by the advent of farming. So focused intentional farming with um, more laterally domestication of animals for the, for the purpose of farming as well. Okay? And that obviously had a huge shift on uh, both the way we live from civilizations, but most certainly on our diet and our diet strategies. So like I say, it's a period of very significant span and development. The paleo diet itself then is based on three main uh, assertions. Uh, firstly, that human genetics have scarcely changed during that time. Um, you know, we're uh, about 98.6, we share about 98.6% of DNA with our, uh, our chimp ancestors. So there's, um, there's, there's obviously a lot of similarities there. But at the same time, with three million base pairs in our genetic codes, very, very small differences make marked, marked effects, okay? So all of us in this room are going to be 99.9, maybe even 99% uh, similar from a genetic perspective, yet we're all very different in our, in our phenotypes and the way that we present. Uh, the second assertion then is that modern humans are well adapted to that diet of the time, so because it was a huge, um, uh, a huge period of span, um, a huge time span, there's, um, there was obviously a f main, a one core of, core of a diet was followed during that time. We didn't, certainly didn't have anything like the food technologies and the foods that we've been exposed to, even in the last 5, 10, let alone 50, 100 years. And then it's, uh, it's also, the other assertion is it's possible to understand what the diet was at that time. Now, of course, we don't have any photographs, any imagery, any written records from these times, but we can gain a lot of information from, uh, from fossils, from uh, archaeological dig sites, as well as uh, looking at modern hunter-gatherers and, uh, and, and making assumptions based on where their, uh, their habits and lifestyles have come from. So why are they interested in paleo diet then? Well, um, a lot of people have this uh, assumption that the Paleolithic period was the healthiest in human history. So it's the first thought of as being a very healthy epoch in, uh, in human history. Paleolithic man was typically described as being taller than we currently are, uh, slender, so far less levels of body fat, good strong bones, so thick, dense uh, um, bone mineral density, as well as strong attachments between bones and muscles, so strong uh, ligaments and connective tissue there. They also had very low rates of morbidity in comparison to what we have just now, so low disease rates. Now, yes, their lifespans would have undoubtedly been shorter than ours because of the lack of um, modern medicine and modern technology, and also the risk of, uh, risk of death. Uh, infant death was incredibly high. Um, risk of being killed or mauled by lions and tigers and so on would have been incredibly high, which not many of us really get exposed to nowadays. So, yeah, the lifespan would have uh, averaged out a good bit shorter, um, but uh, morbidity rates appear to be a lot lower. And then there's this also this, this concept that we all re react to westernization in the same way. So if you take westernized foods and cultures and environments and you put them into uh, relatively primitive um, environments, um, the most recent example would probably be the westernization of places like uh, South Pacific Islands. Okay, we start to see probably group as diseases of westernization appear very quickly, so obesity, diabetes, and so on and so forth. Okay. 
So, what's actually involved then? What are we talking about eating? Uh, on the simple side, we're looking at uh, we're looking at fish, particularly wild caught fish. We're looking at grass-fed beef as opposed to uh, commercially raised grain-fed beef. Uh, we're looking at eggs, a lot of vegetables. Okay, Palaith man would have had a huge plant-based intake because that's that was always going to be a constant in his or her diet. Okay, the ability to hunt would have uh, would have come and gone. It would have been incredibly risky. Uh, but the result was plant life available to eat, so vegetable intake would have been uh, would have been huge, and with that, of course, an accompanying very high fibre intake. Fruit as well, but fruit's going to be very seasonal and uh, and environmental um, dictated. Uh, fungi, so anything else could be gathered there and, and edible, and nuts as well. What they weren't eating was um, certainly grains of modern day grains. There's certainly evidence to the latter stages of the Paleolithic era that uh, a number of wild grains and grasses would have been consumed, but certainly not farmed and domesticated. So, talking about oats, barley, rye, wheat, uh, legumes, um, so um, lentils, pulses, and so on would have been widely consumed because of their, uh, their the lack of preparation. Uh, dairy, um, and the way I think of dairy in the Paleolithic era is as Paleolithic man would have looked at a cow and thought, I'm going to milk that today. <laughs> you know, they would have tried to run away first and foremost, and then maybe come back and try to hunt. Uh, potatoes, although arguably um, certainly in the latter stage of the Paleolithic era, uh, underground storage organs, so tubers and so on, would have been consumed. But again, not particularly energy dense for the amount of energy that Paleolithic man would have needed to expend to get it. So there's going to be a lot of digging, maybe minimal tool use during that time, perhaps. So it's, uh, it, was, it was quite a costly, uh, costly event. And obviously, refined salt, salt sugars, and oils that are, uh, are very present in. Uh, a lot of modern day um, uh, shopping, uh, shopping baskets. So, uh, how do you follow it then? Uh, this chap, Lauren Cordain, uh, <coughs> wrote this book back in two, or sorry, wrote the original um, book, The Paleo Diet, back in 2003. Uh, he'd done quite a bit of research on there and then followed it up with this book, uh, Particular Interest in Athletes, in 2005. Now, the majority of the book is presented towards endurance athletes, and um, we can speculate as to what those reasons are, but most, the vast majority of sports nutrition texts are, are uh, pushed towards endurance athletes because they're the most popular sports and they're also the most easy to study. But in this book then, he, he kind of starts quite early on with uh, an interesting quote. Uh, we realise that nutritional concessions must be made for the athlete who's training at a high volume and it's, whilst it's not impossible to recover from such high training loads on a strict paleo diet, it's somewhat more difficult to recover quickly. So you buy this book thinking that you're going to get the solution about the paleo diet for your athletic performance and then you're hitting the first introduction really with a caveat that yeah, you can probably do this but you know, it might not really work out that well. So we'll explore as to why that might well be. Um, they go on to speculate because it is, or uh, discuss, sorry, because it is more endurance focused that uh, high carb intake from uh, fruits and vegetables are going to be accompanied by a very high fibre intake, which may or may not uh, be beneficial for athletes depending on uh, when they want uh, when they want a fibre in relation to training and competition performance. So it's quite a logical book. Uh, it breaks it down, uh, breaks the exercise down into five critical stages. So eating before exercise, the first one. Uh, their, um, uh, their suggestion is taking mostly carbohydrates, include a little bit of protein in order to get some, uh, some critical branch chain amino acids. Keep it relatively low in fibre because in the pre-exercise time having a, uh, a lot of fibre in the gastrointestinal tract just isn't going to be particularly functional. It's going to potentially add to bloating, it's going to carry extra weight, so for the endurance athletes uh, it's not going to be a priority, that's for sure. Drink to thirst to maintain hydration state and then just maybe top up uh, particularly carbohydrate and fluid in the final 10 minutes before exercise. And then they make some examples as to what that's going to be. So fruit and eggs start off with, fine, we're starting off with paleo ideas, brilliant. We then go straight into applesauce with protein powder. Um, okay, applesauce, yeah, we could probably get some decent paleo versions of it, especially if we make it ourselves. But protein powders, yeah, okay, it might be stretching paleo a little bit further there. Baby foods, modern day baby food, most definitely stretching uh, paleo. Liquid meals, protein sports bars, uh, sports drinks and gels, very difficult to get these paleo alternatives. So we start off in this pre-exercise event with the author saying, yeah, it's going to be pretty tough to make sure you get your carbohydrate timing, your fluid timing just right to enter exercise, just doing paleo or doing strict paleo alone. Moving into exercise, 
Uh, high individual tolerance with what people can cope with, that's uh, it's to be expected. Drink to thirst is their recommendation, potentially include a little bit of sodium to help support electrolytes uh, replacement. Uh, and events um, under 90 minutes, water's fine, and then up to uh, over four hours, looking at between two to 400 calories an hour, which is quite a, quite a decent amount if you're running or if you're cycling to take on. Examples then, uh, hardly any, if any, uh, paleo options in here, all the way down to jelly sandwiches and cookies. Tasty, yes, don't get us wrong, let's not, uh, let's not, do, let's not um, uh, deny ourselves that these things are very satisfying, but um, most certainly not uh, paleo. Stage three then, and this kind of follows on the same thing, or well, this is now post-exercise, good principles, rehydrate, restore, uh, elevate muscle protein synthesis, replace those electrolytes lost in sweat, and try to reduce the acidity of body fluids. We can argue about whether that's useful or not. Recovery drinks, um, egg protein, fantastic. Yeah, we're keeping that within paleo. Uh, fruits and veg, fantastic for, our, for a carbohydrate replacement. They suggest a home brew drink, which I've no reason why they didn't put a bit more effort in there to make it an entirely paleo without the inclusion of, uh, of protein powders. Okay, they could have used perhaps an egg protein powder, but it's still stretching a wee bit. After that immediate post-exercise period, short-term post-exercise, so within the next 60 to 90 minutes, um, characterized by an increased hunger, um, moderate to high glycemic load carbohydrates is the suggestion, solid foods, so let's move away from liquid forms and hopefully decrease the amount of processing involved in this, and looking for a 4 to 1 carb to protein ratio. And this is where we start to get much closer to what we'd expect of a paleo diet, so potatoes, tubers and so on, dried fruits, introducing some grains there, um, and then also introducing some good quality protein sources. And then finally, our, um, our posts, long-term post-exercise, so what you consider to be back to the normal resting diet, so unaffected by exercise, return to strict paleo. Um, keep glycemic loads relatively low, start to rebuild muscle tissue, maintain a healthy uh, pH, optimize body weight, reduce inflammation, and so on. So we're right back into, into paleo foods here. So what they, essentially what the authors are saying then is, but you can probably do paleo for, uh, for endurance exercise, but realistically the exercise components can be very tough to stick to. Once you get either side of that, a few hours away from that, um, you, can, you can most definitely uh, maintain a paleo diet. So it's maybe this idea of paleo being the base as opposed to the rule. So switch around then, let's look at classic sport and exercise nutrition principles and compare that to paleo. Uh, Louise Burke's uh, adapted principles here. Energy needs um, being met and required to support a uh, training program. Can Paleo do it? Yeah, probably yes and no, I would say. Uh, there's certainly potential to get it absolutely right. Probably does need a lot more planning though and requires the athlete to be uh, a lot more self-sufficient. In team sports, that's going to be a lot harder because uh, meals are going to be dictated to them, strategies will be dictated to them. Whereas if it's an individual athlete, yeah, perhaps they've got uh, a good opportunity to do that. Achieve and maintain a suitable physique without compromise to health and performance. I see no reason why uh, muscle mass can't be increased or decreased, body fat can't be increased or decreased in a paleo diet. Support recovery and adaptation between training sessions, providing all those nutrients um, associated with that process. Again, no reason why. It's not as if the paleo diet is, uh, it needs to be lacking carbohydrate and protein for recovery. The one area that uh, pulls in a little bit of doubt is potentially on the removal of dairy and the removal of calcium, and that's going to have a uh, more <coughs> marked effect for female, particularly young female endurance athletes at risk of um, uh, bone mineral density issues. Eating and drinking are probably there for competition. It's going to be very dependent upon that competition and be dependent on that, uh, that athlete and that sport. Reduce risk of sickness and injury. Yep, there's no reason why a paleo diet could not do that, providing you follow those, uh, uh, those good quality principles and eating after exercise in particular to, uh, to help reduce immunosuppression. And then make well-informed decisions about the use of nutritional supplements. Well, strictly speaking, nutritional supplements shouldn't even be a consideration on a strict paleo diet, but there's uh, perhaps, um, well, perhaps it does help support making that informed decision. And then finally, this concept of um, eating in a manner that supports long-term health, enjoying food and its social values. Absolutely see paleo being part of that. It's, uh, it's something that I feel people can 
adapt and adopt into a home lifestyle, into everyday lifestyle. We're certainly seeing far more, far greater commercialization of paleo and paleo options being available uh, um, further and wider. So yeah, there's absolutely no reason why it has to be as restrictive. Perhaps even doesn't even have to be as restrictive as the ketogenic diets that Emily spoke about. So why'd you do it? Why, what's so bad about the classic sport and exercise and nutrition diet that you wouldn't, um, uh, that you would even think about switching? Well, two reasons for me on health and on performance. Health, uh, coming back to this concept of our, our genetic profile and our current food profile. So our current food profile, what we're exposed to has changed massively over the past 50 years, let alone the past five to 10 years. Uh, and there's potentially a mismatch between um, uh, what we're exposed to just now and what our genetic profile uh, we default code for, if you like. Uh, this concept of lack of Western disease and modern day hunter gatherers, that's uh, still debated at the moment. Um, they cut open some, uh, some mummy's tombs like, uh, a few years ago and found um, uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of thickening in arterial walls and so on. So a lot of ath ath sclerosis, excuse my language there. Um, so uh, potentially, there's, uh, we're not saying by any means the paleo man was free of disease. We're just saying that there's far lower morbidity than what we, uh, what we see at the moment. Uh, and then this concept of, um, or this idea of no obvious risk to the majority of people by going paleo. The exception, the caveat I put around that is maybe uh, dairy and bone health. So the young female endurance athlete is going to be at greater risk there and might have to think slightly different. Health-wise, again, improved uh, body composition most certainly is achievable on a paleo diet. It's not to say it's not achievable in this classic sports nutrition diet as well. Though. Reduced inflammation, potentially just through the reduction of uh, sugar intake, maybe grain intake, depending on uh, how important you feel that is for gastrointestinal function. And then there's this idea of greater sustainability as well. So our current food production methods, um, we can argue as to whether they're sustainable or not, but they're very costly. You know, it takes about 43,000 litres of water to produce one kilo of grain-fed beef. Okay, so that's a heck of a lot of, uh, of, of our own fuels being put towards that. It's about 16 calories are used to produce one calorie from grain-fed beef. So we're quite wasteful in that sense. I'm not saying that it's, 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 it's free from uh, any, any fuel usage having a, um, a grass-fed or pasture-raised animal, but uh, potentially it's going to be that little bit less. Flicking to performance then, if you do a PubMed search, PubMed's a, uh, a searchable engine that uh, the vast majority of sport and exercise texts are, um, are found in. You put in paleo and athletes, you get zero hits. You extend that and you put paleolithic and exercise, you get 10 hits. So there really isn't the data there, okay? It's very difficult to control an athlete's diet, particularly a high performance athlete's diet, and shifting from standard Western diet or classic sports nutrition diet to a paleo diet is gonna be a big shift. So it's not surprising that there's not a lot of research there. A lot of its success is going to be based on how flexible the athlete wants to be with their paleo approach. So do they actually want to follow paleo as the base, but accept that in and around exercise in particular, they're going to deviate from that route? Do they want to have paleo plus dairy? Do they want to have paleo plus grains? But there's also a lot of testimonials out there. So LA Lakers, one of the most successful basketball teams in the world, uh, brought in a conditioning coach and a doctor who had ancestral um, ancestral health that they're uh, part of their core practices, changed a lot of the team catering, and a lot of the players have responded very positively to that. Including this guy, Kobe Bryant, one of the most successful basketballers of all time, uh, daily drinks, I think, two cups of bone broth, a bone broth that he makes himself, or he might get his personal chef to make, which maybe makes it a little bit easier for him to control his paleo intake. Uh, CrossFit, CrossFit's a sport, so a very modern um, sort of counterculture sports that uh, has strongly embraced uh, the paleo approach um, and I think we're starting to see that um, kind of what we call uh, tribal tribal nutrition and tribal uh, tribal diets if you like so pockets of paleo being very popular in certain pockets of other um, of, uh, other communities there and that being re that reinforcing the diet so onto some uh, quick practical recommendations for the athlete themselves then, they've got to be interested and motivated. You're not going to be able to get an athlete who um, just picks up a book immediately and goes, oh, I'll flick through it back, yeah, I'll give Paleo a shot. It's not going to work out. They're not going to last. So they've got to be interested and motivated. They've got to have a decent nutrition knowledge. They've got to work out 
It's quite simple to work out what's paleo, what's not paleo. You'll be able to download dozens of apps that'll tell you that as well. You've got to have enough nutrition knowledge to make sure the micronutrient needs are met, the, uh, the macronutrient needs, needs are met, the timings are met to support exercise performance. Therefore, planning and preparation become key skills. Culinary skills actually become really quite important because otherwise they're just going to be stuck to having chicken and spinach for, uh, for the rest of their meals. A supportive environment and social, uh, social acceptance is going to become important, not critical perhaps, but certainly going to become important, especially if the, uh, the athlete is also responsible for meals throughout the rest of the household perhaps, for family members, partners and so on. Accept deviations and respond positively to that, so um, perhaps the success is uh, perhaps the, uh, the appropriate approach for a paleo for a diet. For Paleo for an athlete will be that they accept the fact that there's going to be times it's not going to work out. And instead of taking the easy option, or slightly the easier decision, but harder option of saying, well, I'm not going to eat anything and potentially compromise sporting performance, they say, well, I've got to accept it's not going to work out today. Therefore, I'm going to make the best possible decision based on what's available to me. And then this idea of going beyond paleo. So if somebody does um, uh, immerse themselves in the world of paleo, what's, what do they, where's, the, where's then the, the block ends or the book ends? Or do they go on slightly further? Do they start to get um, a little bit uh, more detailed in their food preparation? Do they look into intermittent fasting regimes? Because again, if you start st and, and therefore start to adopt a bit more of what you expect a hunter-gatherer lifestyle to be, because there would have been huge periods of famine, there'd been long days of famine where um, the environment prevented successful gathering of food and hunt wasn't possible, it was too dangerous. You start to then look into biohacking, so using nutrition and lifestyle to change the way that we're, uh, our body's responding to certain stimulus. We also look at alternative remedies. So uh, the athlete's got to be, uh, it's, it, there's a particular type of athlete that's probably going to work out um, uh, much better for, uh, for the paleo diet. For the practitioner then, so me as the nutritionist or the team sports scientist or the nutrition advisor, whoever it may well be, the influencers, you've got to query the relevance of the paleo diet. So is their standard diet so bad or so wrong that they actually need to make a switch? Perfect diet only ever exists in context. So as soon as that context changes, through age, maturity, body composition changes, sport changes, uh, diet itself. So uh, the paleo diet might only be appropriate for a certain period for that athlete. Variable definitions, like we said, is it paleo plus dairy plus or minus grains, um, and, and therefore various different adherence um, uh, levels to paleo. Diet behaviour monitoring is going to be incredibly important to make sure even just basic macro and micronutrients are met, as well as uh, appropriate timings. That timing of the event intervention as well, the phase of the season is going to be important. Potentially we've got greater benefits or maybe it's just lower risk for non-endurance and potentially male athletes, like I say, the, uh, the female endurance, the young female endurance athlete being at a higher risk. Team catering, if, uh, if me as a nutritionist I want to push paleo more aggressively within a squad, do I have to change everybody's eating habits to get them uh, to, to ensure that the catering is, is appropriate or do I put paleo and non-paleo options av uh, available to me? Influence over peers and teammates, so is it ever going to sit in isolation, one athlete within a team, or are they going to start to spread a message and spread a word, and soon enough you've got three or four or five, half a dozen players all, on, all interested or wanting to follow a paleo approach. And then uh, modern day paleo foods, it's not to say by any means that modern day just eating paleo foods gives you the perfect diet and automatically leads to the best balance of, um, of macro and micronutrients. Modern day paleo foods um, have a lot of time are very intentionally designed to hit these, uh, these beautiful senses of sugary, salty and fatty and then that crunchy texture there. So just because it's paleo doesn't mean it should be consumed. You know, if a paleo label doesn't give you automatic free reign to consume it and consume as much of it as you want. And I'm, I'm no doubt you're all aware of the number of um, paleo websites promoting paleo cookies and, uh, and cakes and so on and so forth. So uh, maybe that's just a part of our modern culture that we genuinely want our cake and want to eat it, but we don't suffer any of those consequences. And of course, paleo is still evolving. We're going to start to narrow down particular periods where we think paleo uh, diet was uh, quite tightly defined and therefore is going to be more or less suitable for certain individuals. Or we're going to find um, more evidence to support the fact that um, the paleo with man's diet was far more varied than we perhaps once thought and we should uh, put less pressure on ourselves to be consumed. So wrapping up then, a couple of quick conclusions. 
Pellet diet would appear to be safe for the right athlete. So if you're the practitioner, you've got to pick your athlete, uh, picking the right times to, uh, to introduce that approach. Understand what it means to talk about paleo and what it means for your athletes. So for some, I guess some guys come to me, some rugby players come to me and say, yeah, I've been really following this intensive paleo, uh, paleo lifestyle recently. Go, okay, well, what do you have for breakfast? Well, breakfast I have porridge every morning, porridge and milk every morning. That's how I start off and then I have my protein shake. Okay, um, do you maybe have that recovery shake that we give you after morning training? Yeah, 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 yeah. the guys make that up and, and I take that, I do that every day. And then lunch, I always have what's available at the club and you know, if it's, a, if it's a double or triple training session day, then I'll maybe put a bread roll in at lunchtime. Okay, so what do you have when you get home at night? Well, uh, no carbs at all, it's just, it's always just chicken or, or fish and veg. All right, so actually, and what do you do before you go to bed? Yeah, um, it's always milk and, milk and a banana before I go to bed. That really helps me sleep. So all you're really thinking paleo is, is cutting out rice and pasta and breads at your evening meal. So there's a lot of this uh, that kicks around then, that paleo might be the base, or they might think that it's the base, but it's not necessarily the rule. And then of course it's going to be important to monitor player status or athlete status and monitor their behaviours then. At what point does uh, a, a, a desire to um, maintain a paleo diet overrule their ability or compromise their ability to perform? Uh, well, where I've kind of rushed through that, I was just desperate to keep everybody else back on track and uh, keep all in line because I screwed up with the IT at the start. But uh, feel free to fire any questions just now, or like I say, I'll be around for the rest of the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Has anyone got any questions, Richard? Yes. Well, what about how does it relate to being ketogenic? Um, come on up. Um, I would probably say there's no reason why you couldn't follow a. A number of Paleolithic foods are going to be are going to support a ketogenic diet. The difficulty is going to be having a diverse enough range of fat. I would say because one of the issues that Emily didn't touch on, particularly for the athlete, is in, we want to adopt a, a ketogenic approach. Is keeping the protein intake low enough so that we're not going gluconeogenic and, and producing carbohydrates, uh, fuel sources, and glucose fuel sources from excessive protein. So uh, it, it, would, it would take a very intelligent diet plan and a very intelligent athlete to be able to do it. I think you'd probably look to, to uh, consume one over the other. I was going to say, just on that, Yeah. Uh, yeah, very much so. Um, there's, there's a reality that when you're in the bike for, okay, these guys are the, the super elite. When, if I went to cycle a Tour de France stage, it would take me 16 hours. It's going to take them four or five. Um, and they're very, very adapted, well adapted at burning fat as a primary fuel source. So they get a much higher intensity than uh, most of us, and that's not disrespecting hopefully any elite cyclists in the audience, but a much higher level of exercise they can burn fat as a predominant fuel source. So when you've got a, say, a six hour stage race and, uh, on, and with uh, very high intensity periods of, of effort, the reality is that what you start your resting glycogen stores at for that day aren't going to last. So you're going to have to top up on the bike. So then the question comes, actually, do we need to start fully glycogen loaded? Or actually, the profile of that stage is flat for the first three hours worth of cycling. I can actually take over in a uh, fat's uh, dominant metabolism throughout that period. And then we start to push in carbohydrate for the big climbs, perhaps. So this idea. The, the holy grail for the athlete is this metabolic flexibility where you can quickly switch from being carbohydrate dominant in order to reach the upper intensities, the real high intensities, and sustain them versus uh, being a, a, a low carbohydrate utilization metabolism where we can, uh, we can stave off hunger, uh, support performance more, uh, more efficiently, if you like. Yes. Anyone else? Yes. Hi, um, I'm just wondering about your thoughts on legumes, really. Mm -hmm. so I can see lots of reasons not to have some of the other stuff you're not supposed to have. Yep. Um, grains, even with dairy, yes, there's the argument about calcium. You can get calcium from vegetable sources as well. Sure. You work really hard at it. Um, and with legumes, I can see that in the Paleolithic times, you wouldn't have had that because of the requirements to prepare it so that lentils, etc., are toxic. Mm. 
Um, but then I'm thinking about the benefits that can be gained in modern society that we live in. We have the we have the ability to cook lentils and even thinking about peanuts, which I think are technically a legume yep. rather than a nut. And just your thoughts in general around that. Well, when when you look at some of the paleolithic material, they 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 state exactly what you say there in legumes. They'll talk about the toxins, talk about the phytic acids and, uh, and so on in there that uh, we, we managed to reduce successfully during heating and preparation or at least just soaking. So a lot of this flexible paleo diet talks about soaking legumes overnight and so on to, uh, to make them easier to, to digest. Now, um, it's undoubtedly that they would have been available there and people would have consumed them. When I switch that around and say, well, what are those other nutritional benefits of legumes? You talk about protein, but a modern paleo diet shouldn't be limited in protein. We talk about the fibre from the uh, from from the outer husk there, and again, vegetable and fruit intake should be ramped up enough that fibre isn't going to be an issue. So, are they are they going to be essential? Probably not, because I think we can get everything else from other sources. But I, I always take a food first approach. So I would look at it as in holistic terms and say, well, do you know, they're, they're, they're good foods. Let's let's include them in some shape or form. So. Particularly for the athletes, I'd say, look, there's another good carbohydrate source that we can have. And uh, because we've minimized our modern carbohydrate sources through absence of grains, I would say, yeah, absolutely, um, prepare them correctly and then incorporate them. Is viewing it from a sense of increased variability and Definitely, acceptability yeah. of this kind of diet one you Sorry, we can't hear you. Sorry, we're talking about the, um, uh, the importance of it in order to increase the variability within the diet there being really quite important and, uh, like say, stop that athlete getting into chicken and spinach for every meal. <laughs> okay, so thank you. No problem at all, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, so we've got a little break time again now, I think.